I'd like to compliment the IEA as well on their great work. It provides a great forum for an interchange of ideas. And uh, we're firmly at, in Europe, and we intend staying there. I'm a committed European myself that this forum uh, gives us an opportunity to share ideas and discuss issues. And it's very important in civil society that organisations such as this uh, would be there to reinforce democracy. It's my third time in government, as Brendan said, and this one is, is entirely different. Uh, it's also different in, in Europe. I go over and back to Brussels and Luxembourg quite a lot, and things have changed from the previous council meetings I used to attend. It's got very informal. It's all first names now. It's Michael and Christine and Elena and Wolfgang, and everyone chats away all the time. So that's very, very comforting. Uh, secondly, um, English has become the lingua franca of the community. Uh, occasional, occasional breaks into French. But compared to what it was like when I started in the 80s, uh, when everybody spoke their national language and you were picking it up on your earphone, uh, you know, and it made it very stilted and formal. Now, since they're all fluent English speakers, it, it moves over and back in real debate. And it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, that makes it interesting for ministers in one way and difficult in another way. Because in the olden days, if I call the 80s the olden days, ministers frequently used the pre-prepared speaking note and just read it out uh, to give the national policy position. Now there's a real debate that goes on all the time. And you're challenged on your views across the table. And you, you, know, you need to know where you stand and where your country stands so that you can hold up, hold up your side. So that, that's probably the good side of it. The downside of it is that the Commission isn't as strong as it was uh, when I was, say, Minister for Industry and Commerce dealing with the internal market. Uh, the bigger countries now are taking a lead role. Uh, that's uh, even truer in the 17 rather than the 27, because in the 17 there's a tendency for France and Germany to think of the euro as their project. And not only did they put it together in the first instance, but they feel responsible for keeping it going and keeping it strong. Uh, so in that respect, the Commission isn't as central as it was. And that's bad for Ireland. So one of our policy positions is uh, to always be committed to keeping the role of the Commission strong and reinforcing it if we can. Because big countries, all countries act ultimately in their own interest. And big countries always act in their own interest in the long term. And uh, smaller countries need uh, to have the protection of their own collegiality and also the protection of the Commission. So I think that that's a very important point. Uh, it's also the case now that the IMF and the ECB are equal partners at meetings. Uh, so again, that has diminished the role of the Commission somewhat. But the IMF is a different IMF from uh, the kind of IMF that was portrayed as intervening and wrecking the lives of poor people in sub-Saharan Africa. It's a totally different IMF now, and the present IMF leadership is very supportive of Europe, and Christine Lagarde is particularly supportive of the Irish position, and is, is very, very helpful. Uh, firstly, you know, to get down to the few words I want to share with you, the euro is, has been a great success. Uh, the euro was put in place 12 years ago, and since then, uh, over the 12 years, inflation in Europe has always been below 2% annual inflation. It actually has been a better uh, corrector of inflation than the German mark that Germans like so much. As well as that, uh, European trade has increased by 50% since the euro was established. And, you know, that has led to growth and wealth and good lifestyles for, for European citizens. Uh, as well as that, the value of the currency has gone up. Even now that it's uh, under stress, it's in the it's in the one thirties. Where when it was put in place, I think it started at one seventeen to one twenty around there. And you'll notice that when the Swiss uh, wanted to bring down the value of the Swiss franc recently, just four or five weeks ago, they didn't benchmark against the yen or the dollar or go back to the gold standard. They benchmarked against uh, the euro at one twenty, which was a very recent vote of confidence in. Uh, the future of the euro, and also in, in the value of the euro. So I think we should remember that. The crisis, is not a, the crisis is not a euro crisis. The crisis is a euro land crisis. 
and it's the difficulties in certain countries, including Ireland, to adopt to a common currency. That's the crisis, not the currency itself. And we can be very confident in the currency itself. The reason that there is a problem in Euroland is that when the currency was put in place 12 years ago, the kind of policy instruments which would be familiar to anybody who knows the United States were never put in place in Europe. Things like uh, automatic stabilizers, fiscal transfers, uh, fiscal bonds being issued by the Fed, none of those were available in Europe. So when the euro came under threat and under stress, the policy instruments weren't in place to defend it. And then there was a mad scramble to retrofit the policy instruments to protect the currency. And in that mad scramble, I'm afraid the European leadership has failed until very recently to get ahead of the curve. But it's not that nothing was done. A lot was done. You know, just this time last year, there was no ESFF. There was no ESFM. There was no ESM agreed. So, you know, we have other institutions in Europe now that can give money to countries like ourselves in Portugal in programmes. None of that was in place uh, 12 months ago. When the first bailout for Greece occurred, it was done on, on a series of bilateral arrangements with individual countries. But now there's an institutional framework to deal with that. And, of course, issues of governance have come up the line as well, and uh, there is a great movement on that. But the, the failure all the time has been that over the two-year period, and particularly in, last, in the last 12 months, the solutions have fallen short of the problem. And while the markets would be convinced for a week or two or three, market turbulence would reassert itself and the solutions would prove inadequate. So the building of the policy instruments has to continue. At long last, we thought we had a major breakthrough at the heads meeting last week. Because for the first time, rather than taking you know, individual problems and trying to tailor a solution to them, there was a, an approach to have a, a comprehensive and integrated solution. And I would think it was a very good approach. You know, recapitalize the banks, build the firewall against contagion, deal with Greece, advance the governance issues so that we don't go back into this again in two or three years' time, make the fix a generational fix. And finally, uh, have a growth program for Europe by structural reform across the community and encourage individual growth programs in individual economies. That's the package that's there now. And, you know... Uh, we thought we had a solution, and I think we have a solution institutionally when the work continues and these proposals are fleshed out. But then Mr. Papandreou called the referendum, and that has uh, thrown the markets into chaos again. And I presume there are political problems in Greece, and I suggest that the solutions will have to be political. Uh, I've said already to a number of people that, you know, democracies live by elections. And we should never fear changes of government. This time last year, uh, you remember, <coughs> would the Greens stay in government? Would they leave government? Would the budget go through? Would the budget not go through? Would the government continue? Would they have a majority? Would the finance bill go through? Uh, should there be a new leader? Should there be a new Taoiseach? Is there going to be a leadership heave in Fianna Fáil? So we shouldn't be surprised when we look at Greece, because we've had a very recent experience of political instability ourselves. And it always culminates sooner or later in an election and usually in a change of administration. So, you know, that's democracy. And in the nation which founded democracy, I don't think we should be looking too askance at the fact that they, they are now look as if the government may be losing its mandate. Or, indeed, Mr. Papandreou may be strong enough to reassert himself and move forward. The, but I think the solutions of, of, of the firewall and the recap and all the rest of it uh, are the solutions on which the new Europe uh, will be built and which the currency will be stabilised. Because for the first time we will have uh, instruments of policy along the lines of the United States, which I suppose is the most successful common currency area that we can bring forward as an example. And, you know, imitation is a sincerest form of flattery, but if something is working well and there are policy instruments that you can model and bring them in for the euro, well then that's what should be done. I'd like now to move to our own government here. We're seven months in office. I think it's an open secret that we're surprised ourselves 
that we are further up the road than we thought we'd be just seven months ago. We're fulfilling the programme and that's being acknowledged uh, by all our colleagues in Europe and by the European authorities. We're also restoring Ireland's reputation in Europe. Uh, we had a bad reputation. I think it came from the Celtic Tiger. There was a lot of hubris and there was a lot of arrogance. And I'm not just talking about a political level. You know, we had Irish people lecturing Europeans on how to get rich by selling houses to each other. And, uh, and they said, that's a bubble. And now they were inclined to say, I told you so, when the, when the thing collapsed. So there was a bad feel. There was a very bad feel. But we have uh, repaired that. The Tarnished have brought all the diplomatic corps back to Dublin and kind of reset the programme for the diplomatic corps. And uh, they're, you know... They're on a single message now lobbying influential people right across Europe. Ministers are attending all the council meetings and our, our, our staffs are, are integrating and mixing and making friends. And we have a, a lot of friends in Europe and certainly our reputation has improved. And that's very important because you know the thing, give a dog a bad name, you know. And a lot of what's happening in Greece is give a dog a bad name. If you look at the raw figures in Greece in terms of the government making fiscal corrections, they have made huge strides, and yet they're getting no credit at all, and you get caricature images of Greece uh, in the media. So reputation does matter. It, it allows you to move forward. We're growing again economically. The first two quarters have shown significant growth. Uh, the third quarter, uh, we know from anecdotal evidence, is growing as well. And even though we'll have to mark down growth for next year, it will still be quite positive. The growth in our customer countries are falling away, and if you have an export-led mo growth model, obviously if your customers can't buy as much, you have to pull back a little bit. But uh, we'll use the best evidence in putting the budgetary figures together. And uh, we had, last April, said that growth in 2012 would be 2.5%. It won't be that now, and we'll be pulling it back so that our budget uh, calculations are realistic. We're in balance of payments surplus as well. And we're going to have another strong surplus in the balance of payments this year. And that's very good news as well because, you know, if you're, uh, if you're earning more than you're spending, it's, it's, it's not a definition of insolvency anyway. So, you know, a balance of payments surplus is a, is a measurement of solvency. It's not the only one, but it's also very good news. Uh, if you take um, Greece, has about 20% of its economy is uh, in exports. Over 100% of the Irish economy is involved in exports, you know, of GDP. So there's a huge difference in the model. And in terms of the reputation, we're always stressing that Ireland is far more, has far more in common with the North European economies, like the UK and the Netherlands and Germany, in terms of the way we're structured, in terms of our competitiveness, in terms of the way we do business, than we have with the peripheral economies of the Mediterranean, uh, where, with which we were bracketed until recently. So in terms of you know, resetting the reputation of the country, we're strongly pushing the line that we're a North European economy and we're prepared to do things the way North Europeans do things with their economies and we're prepared to you know, take the correction measures necessary uh, to stay in that group of countries rather than on the Mediterranean group. The banks have been restructured as well, you'll be familiar with that. Uh, that has been quite successful. Uh, we were very fortunate to get private sector interest in Bank of Ireland. And, you know, that was one of the confidence-building measures during the summer. Uh, the banks are still building confidence. There's an inflow of deposits now in September and October. So after deposits declining for a long period, they're growing again. And also the banks are accessing money on the markets. So the banks are, the banks are actually back in the markets now. Uh, the banks are getting wholesale, a couple of the banks have got wholesale money uh, at 4% on a on three-month rollover basis. So, you know, Ireland may be out of the market, but as soon as you get the banks going back in, well, <coughs> we're, we're moving in the right direction. We've renegotiated the programme as well. You know, we said we would and we got a mandate to do it. But we didn't see, we don't see renegotiation as, as a once-off event. We see it as a rolling event. And we have two phases of it behind us, and there's a third phase coming up. The first phase was around the time of the jobs initiative. Uh, I suppose the flag there was the minimum wage, but it was only a minor part of it. Uh, the big issues there was we got permission to bring the VAT rate down from 13.5 to 9, and to focus it on the hospitality industry. 
because you know tourism obviously has to be one of the big industries in Ireland and it had fallen off by 30% over three years. And all the infrastructure is there. It doesn't require additional investment. The hotels, the golf courses, the airports, the roads, it's all there. So what you need really is, is to make the country competitive. And this was an attempt at that, and it worked as well. As well as that, the, the adjustment period for the programme is now going to 2.15, so we negotiated an extra year uh, for the correction process. The second phase of the negotiation was something that we argued long and hard, that the programme was incorrectly priced and that the interest rates were too high. And after kind of five months of constant battle and argument, uh, we got uh, that revised in, in July and at the heads of state meeting, uh, we got uh, interest rates reduced uh, to effectively the cost of the, of the money on the bond market without margins being added. That has made a huge difference. Uh, it makes a difference... Uh, like in this year's budget now, we'd be in extreme difficulty if we didn't have the interest rate reduction because it gives us, uh, it reduces our costs on interest rates by about 900 million and uh, that compensates for the fall off in the growth rates, which I drew your attention to, and for uh, some fall off in VAT receipts as well. It doesn't give us extra money to spend, but if we didn't have it, uh, we'd be in dreadful difficulty going into this budget and now it has you know, the swings have cancelled out the roundabouts and this was one of, this was one of the big swings. Uh, the third phase of the renegotiation is very important and it's something that we're, we're trying to position. We want the overall burden of debt to be reduced. And this is the argument we use when we're talking about the promissory note in Anglo-Irish Bank. But that's an example to get the issue on the table in Europe. And we're open to suggestions from them as to other means of reducing the overall burden of debt. Uh, because while we are sustainable, I would prefer if we were 15 or 20 billion lower on the overall burden of debt going back into the markets in 2013. So this phase of renegotiation is more a medium-term project. Uh, but, you know, we have set up uh, our negotiating positions already and they're engaging with us. They haven't said they've got the debt yet, but they're engaging with us in preparing policy papers. So while I can tell you that this is going to happen. I can tell you there's a process in place which may lead to, uh, you know, we getting a reduction in the overall burden of our debt by some mechanism which we will identify as things go forward. So I'm quite confident about the future of Europe. You know, you, you, can, you can lose your way if you just look at particular events. But if you can rise above particular events and look forward, uh, Europe is very strong at us. 27 democracies working together. I mean, it's not so long ago back to the time when the Berlin Wall was still there. And um, Eastern Europe and its great civilization was like something that where the deluge had come in and kind of cities that we know from our history books had disappeared from view. Now, Eastern Europe is back there. They're in with us. They're thriving. Poland has the presidency at the minute. They're just having, after having a successful election from the government's point of view, because they got re-elected. And uh, they're thriving, they're moving forward, they're showing growth. And the small countries of Eastern Europe, uh, I mean, they really love the community. They, they really aspire to be members of the community and they're working it hard, you know. So we shouldn't be cynical about the community. The European project is an absolutely marvellous project. It's one of the most historic things that has happened in this generation or in any other generation. And we shouldn't let it slip from us uh, through lack of effort. There are difficulties. Uh, one is the diminishing role of the Commission, which I referred to already. Another is, the, is the, 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 I suppose the best way of putting it is, the growing nationalism across European countries. That's an emerging problem which we need to watch very carefully. And it's manifesting itself all the time now at council meetings where ministers say quite openly, I, 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 I'd, like, I'd agree to that, but I can't get it through my parliament because we have coalition partners on the right or on the left and they're taking a very narrow nationalistic view and the country's interest coming before the community's interest and that making it difficult to go forward. And you know examples of it across Europe in different countries. You've seen the true Finns on the part that played in the election in Finland. So it's something I just want to put a marker down on. 
Uh, the other thing I think where Ireland can play a role is the, 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 the danger of two Europes. You know, there's 17 in the euro and there's 27 altogether. And uh, we meet as, 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 as the euro group first in Brussels. And then we meet as 20, at 17 and then we meet as 27. And there is a danger that you'll get two agendas. you get two policy agendas emerging. So I think Ireland and the smaller countries have a role. It's in our interest uh, to keep Europe integrated and to keep it as a, a unit of 27 and not a kind of a twin-track Europe with uh, a 17 in, in the common currency zone led by France and Germany driving it forward and the 27 being somewhat adrift. You know, already there have been suggestions on the margin that as the 10 nations that aren't in the euro see us meeting every month as a group of 17 and all key decisions in effect now being taken in the group of 17 and being run by the 27 subsequently. I've heard suggestions that the 10 should start meeting separately. Uh, you're going down a very dangerous road if that happens. So it's again, as I presume many of you here are interested Europeans, I'm flagging one of the risks I see and I'm flagging an area where Ireland can help uh, to, to integrate. So generally I'm optimistic. Uh, the budget is coming forward and uh, we, we'll deal with that. Uh, the first budgetary document will be published tomorrow and there'll be a lot of economic analysis about where we are and uh, what the basis for the assumptions of where we are are. But more importantly, there'll be a table in it uh, which will set the targets uh, for the deficit right up to 215, with the one in 215 being below 3%. And it will go on then to uh, say what the annual quantum of adjustment will be in each budget up to 215 to arrive at those targets. And the quantum will be divided uh, between tax increases and expenditure reductions. Now, we're obviously doing this in the interest of transparency and accountability, but more importantly, we think that many of our people, both in their personal lives and in their business lives, are very uncertain of the future and actually think that things are worse than they are. And we think that this will help to build confidence by putting it out starkly. This is where we are now. This is how we're going to get to minus three by 215. And these are the these are the modifications we'll have to make in each budget going forward. We won't be breaking it down department by department. That will happen later on because there's going to be a number of pre-budget announcements and my colleague Brendan Howland uh, will give the breakdown, departmental breakdown before the budget itself. So thank you very much. You've been a very attentive audience. I hope I haven't bored the pants off here. So I'll uh, <laughs> take the question.